interrupt for a short while. Thank you very much for coming this evening. Uh, we're delighted to be having the party for Jesse Norman's book about Edward Burke. Um, it has had terrific reviews. Um, we have lots of copies, so please do buy copies. Um, that's really what I need to say. Uh, we have three people who are going to carry on speaking. Uh, first of all, Lord Sutton. Thank you very much. Um, the CPS is um, as delighted as Andrew is to, to um, make this joyous event for Jesse. Where is he? Up here. I'm looking. Um, <laughs> He's the big guy. So, uh, let me put it to you all this way. We, we, the CPS um, held another book launch party about a week ago, which was for Charles Moore's book about Margaret Thatcher. In that um, book, he describes um, a scene in which Mrs. Thatcher sat on the floor in the first offices of the CPS. Um, she was um, putting the wiring into the plug that was going to be used for the kettle in the first CPS office. But Charles Moore points out that what, in fact, she was doing, she wasn't wiring the plug for a kettle. What she was doing was rewiring conservatism. <laughs> now, in order to know what the, what the what conservatism is, um, you you really have to study this man's book. Because um, it, it, all are agreed, and Alistair Cook, the official historian of the Conservative Party, is going to speak a little bit, I'm sure, will confirm it, that the intellectual starting point of conservatism is, of course, Edmund Burke. Um, the question that arises about the relationship between Edmund Burke and Mrs. Thatcher is whether they had exactly the same view of what conservatism is. Because pragmatism and idealism are um, an uncomfortable partnership in conservative history. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but one of Jesse's previously masterful um, treatises is about Michael Oakeshott. And by the time you've talked about Edmund Burke, Michael Oakeshott, and um, Margaret Thatcher, I think you may have uh, explained to historians <laughs> what conservatism is about. But unlike other political parties, we don't have a canon of great works to which we can turn to understand conservatives. In fact, conservatives generally don't trust blueprints of that kind, regarding them as rather more socialist um, activities. So um, we don't have a, a version of the Sermon on the Mount. We don't have a version of the um, Declaration of Independence. We don't have a version of the Communist Manifesto. All that we have to turn to are the great historians, and Jesse is now entering that canon. Now to introduce Jesse and put this marvellous book into context, there is not possibly anybody better Lord Lexington, otherwise known as Alistair Cook, um, who has been the, the person who for 20 years ran, in effect, the, well, he ran the Conservative Research Department Central Office for 20 years, probably the most respected political thinker about conservatism that we've had in our generation. Um, Alistair is now going to say a word to put Jesse's book into a historic context. Lord Lexington. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, my lords, ladies and gentlemen, I thought that my lord Sarch's comments were disappointing in one respect. I was hoping to hear that uh, after fixing the wiring, uh, Mrs. Thatcher had either said something about Edmund Burke or perhaps declared a, a, an intention to read uh, Edmund Burke. Um, this is not at all clear from the great uh, Charles Moore's life, and I think we really should uh, find out. It's a pity we uh, can no longer ask her, but I'm sure it won't be beyond the uh, uh, exacting uh, and detailed research of Jesse Norman to find out the, the, the existence of a connection, or perhaps the exist existence of no connection at all between uh, Margaret Thatcher and uh, Edmund Burke. I have a, a, a very um, a simple and uh, delightful uh, task, which is to say that uh, I have uh, submitted this great work uh, to uh, scrutiny, from the point of view of the uh, official historian of the Conservative Party, and I declare that it is uh, admirable in uh, all respects. Um, I would not come here to say anything. I've spent a uh, uh, long part of my life reviewing uh, books, um, and I said to myself very firmly, well, if there's anything that matter, I shan't be able to come this evening, because uh, what I can't do is to give any kind of critical uh, uh, comment on this great on this great work. It's hard, I think, um, to speak uh, uh, on this occasion in light-hearted fashion 
um, Jesse may correct me, but I haven't come across many jokes that uh, Edmund Burke himself made, I'm sure it being the 18th century, uh, some would uh, make jokes about him. But he's not a, a light-hearted uh, character. Um, he deserves the treatment that he has been given, uh, which is full and considered and deeply uh, interesting. Um, it's a book that does two things. Um, it uh, tells you about the career of this extraordinary Irish, penniless Irish adventure, encumbered by relatives that uh, didn't always reflect great credit upon him. A penniless Irish adventurer who established himself uh, in the, set the center of the governing circles of the uh, late 18th century and became identified, as uh, you all know, with uh, great causes. Uh, great causes that then uh, gave rise to political campaigns of great importance uh, to uh, confront this government in India, to confront unfairness towards Catholics uh, in Ireland, to confront what Burke regarded as the growing power of the uh, crowd um, exercised through uh, Parliament in ways that ought to be uh, corrected. Uh, uh, the campaign in favour of the colonists in America, and of course the campaign um, to draw attention to the excesses uh, and horrors of the French Revolution. Um, Jesse will undoubtedly uh, speak a little of these uh, campaigns, which did not lead uh, to great success, but had and left a tremendous imprint on the politics of the, of the period. So that's part one of the uh, book, um, uh, Birth the Man, and then uh, Burke, uh, the thinker. And uh, the range is very wide, um, encompasses all, it seems to me, that uh, should be said uh, about the diverse strands of thought, and reaches the clear conclusion, and I think we need to hear a little bit about um, this aspect, that Burke was, for all those who regarded him as a Whig, he considered himself, was actually the first uh, conservative, the first who forges a serious body of uh, conservative thought, as I think Jesse more or less uh, puts it. He will forgive me if the quotation isn't entirely accurate. Uh, there's another, um, uh, and I'll end here, there's another uh, point, um, it's striking. Um, it comes in the very last paragraph of the last chapter. And mentioning it, one risks, of course, the charge of having read the book properly. Um, you have gone straight to the end. But uh, uh, Jesse compares um, the state of uh, politics today, and uh, I will leave him to uh, explain uh, the unfortunate aspect of uh, politics today, which he believes uh, ought to be considered in relation to Burke, moral, moral authenticity. Uh, his principle, his sense of his sense of history. So all those who have read this book already will know how splendid it is, uh, and all those who have come tonight um, to purchase a copy will soon find out how splendid it is. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very, very much indeed, Alistair and Morris, uh, and Andrew, for that um, magnificently generous and kind introduction. Uh, it is such a pleasure to be here in this temple of books, surrounded by these spectacular volumes, lovingly arrayed with such a sense of kind of joy and learning. It's absolutely magnificent, um, and I'm enormously grateful for that. I I'm rather new to this book signing game. I did one um, the other day, the first time, and I uh, was seated behind a kind of ziggurat of volumes. And um, this enormously distinguished um, elder gentleman came up to me and leant forward, and my hand was poised, ready to go, and um, broke open. And he said, Excuse me, um, could you tell me the way to the toilet? <laughs> <laughs> it was a catastrophic start. And I'm trying to recover from that. Um, I think Burke would be pleased that I'm here, um, not quite in defiance of the whip, but certainly with a degree of grumbling, because we're a running three line whip for the finance bill. 
uh, which uh, no one could ignore. I, I can't comment on the question of whether um, Burke uh, uh, and Mrs. Thatcher had a direct linkage, um, but I can tell you that um, Mrs. Thatcher was very exercised at one point about the need for intellectual uh, forebears and predecessors, and of course she had Hayek, the great big mud, um, but she was also um, enormously impressed by Oakshot, although possibly slightly hazy on the details, because she said famously to her team, um, we must give that man Oakshot a knighthood, and they did, uh, giving one to Walter Oakshot, uh, who was then um, uh, the Provost of Winchester. Um, it was an unfortunate, unfortunate moment. Um, Burke is not a, a, a huge man for jokes, um, although he has a wonderful uh, uh, kind of natural uh, quotability that sustains him. Uh, but uh, there are one or two jokes uh, in the book which I will leave for you to um, discover. There's a moment, I will actually mention one. I was extraordinarily thrilled, I've never mentioned this before, but I was extraordinarily thrilled to um, smuggle into the book um, a line from um, a, the great S.J. Perelman, who, um, as you may know, wrote Monkey Business for the Marx Brothers. Um, and in the course of a slightly technical discussion about aesthetics, um, I, uh, I, I refer to his famous article, which begins, De Gustibus, ain't what they used to be. <laughs> I'm pleased to say that made it into the final text. Very, very happy. Um, so, so let me briefly, if I may, then just break, introduce you, reintroduce you to Burke, um, a, a, a great statesman, a great thinker, a great orator, a man who fought five uh, titanic battles through his own uh, life uh, for a, a fairer treatment of the Irish, and in particular for the Catholics in Ireland, Ireland um, for the rights uh, of the colonists in America um, against the spreading uh, power of the crown and its influence, uh, and the influence of the executive over parliament, um, uh, for accountability in the government uh, and the governance of India through the East India Company, and finally, of course, against uh, mob rule and the revolution uh, in France. Um, uh, now, these great battles were unified by a single threat, what, what Conor Cruz O'Brien calls the uh, echoing Yates, the great melody, and that is Burke's um, detestation of the abuse of power and uh, his absolute desire to hold power, however exercised, uh, uh, to account. Um, but there is also, uh, and I, I, I mention these, uh, uh, various lesser battles which he's less well known and less well identified with. One of these uh, would be um, uh, his uh, a memo, a private memo he wrote in 1780, um, outlining a, a humane regulation of the slave trade prior to its abolition. This is seven years before the abolitionist movement begins uh, in England. Uh, another one would be a private memo, again, he wrote, arguing against government intervention in the corn supply um, at the time uh, of the Napoleonic Wars in order to ensure uh, a proper uh, uh, supply of corn. But he is, as Alistair has said, the first conservative. He's the first man to forge a distinctively uh, conservative and coherent body of thought. Um, and rather than go into that in detail, I thought I might just pick out six lessons that I think have a resonance for contemporary politics, if I might. Um, the first um, uh, uh, concerns uh, the evils of what we might call extreme liberalism. Um, it is a fact of human psychology that if you show someone images of money, um, they become more greedy uh, and more individualistic. Um, uh, it is a fact uh, uh, that if you prime people uh, with economic cues, this changes their character. In other words, we are social animals, this great uh, Aristotelian insight which Burke takes up. Uh, and when you surround people with these images, you do change their natures. And um, uh, it's, an argument, it's an argument to be made that extreme liberalism, particularly in the financial markets, has done that. Uh, and uh, Burke is a standing rebuff to that. He is a rebuff to the idea that the individual uh, will cannot be made the subject of duties that an individual arrogance, or indeed generational arrogance, should be allowed to predominate. Um, his whole philosophy is one which regards um, the social order as a trust which we receive and which it is our duty to uh, enhance, to protect, and to pass on properly, uh, uh, thus enhanced, to the next generation. It is the antithesis of greed. It is the antithesis of any kind of nastiness. And uh, I um, long for the moment where, as a conservative, I can make this argument to the British people. 
um, because it is a very, very humane and naturally compassionate argument. Second, Burke insists that a government must be with the temper of the people. It is the first duty of a governor to understand um, the character of the people whom he or she seeks to govern. Uh, and the, the, the British people um, are, uh, for him, like all nations, a moral essence. And that moral essence is one of moderation, by and large, although fury when roused. Uh, and uh, he therefore is, offers a, a, as it were, a standing corrective to what happens when people fail to consult the circumstance. He says circumstances give to every political principle its uh, distinguishing colour and discriminating effect. And therefore you cannot just yank some word out of the, the word equality or the word, uh, as it were, um, you know, uh, uh, well-being. You cannot just yank it out of its or right. You cannot yank it out of its context. You must work with it in context. You must understand its historical meaning, and only thus can you uh, use it for purposes of governing. And this is a wonderful corrective to policy disasters that range from Vietnam, the creation of the best and the brightest of the um, uh, uh, Kennedy and then Johnson White Houses, uh, to Iraq in our own time. It is a standing correction to um, the overreaching of expertise in a certain kind of uh, reason. Uh, and it is, uh, I think, a celebration of uh, tradition, of inherited wisdom, and above all, in modern terminology, of social capital. Um, Burke's is a philosophy which despises the abuse of power, private and public, when he holds uh, Warren Hastings to account by putting him on trial in Westminster Hall for seven years in a kind of Harry Potter versus Voldemort duel to the death. Um, um, and that's quite unfair to Hastings, but you'll excuse me the image. Um, um, he does it, he rehabilitates this ancient procedure because he can find no other means as a backbencher to hold the power, the depredations as he sees it of the East India Company uh, to effect. And when he does that, he's not merely making a point that public power must be held accountable, he's making a point that private power must be held accountable to India cannot be governed by a company in such, uh, let alone in such a, 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 a way. Um, he, this is a philosophy who's, um, uh, which rests on a conception of modesty and moderation. The social order is a complex thing. It is the duty of a leader to understand that uh, and to work with it, as I've discussed. Um, but the counterpart of that is that uh, you end up with a philosophy of slow government, of, of almost of humility in leadership. And uh, you have a, a rhetoric, a language of the common good and of duty and of public service. And uh, the best exam example of that that I can think of um, in, in uh, uh, the modern era um, actually dates not from this century, or not from the last, but from the 19th century, and it's Abraham Lincoln, a man always associated with pain, but who I regard as, uh, in his own actions, a great Burkean. Um, the fifth, representative, the fifth uh, uh, lesson is one of representative government. Burke is the architect of representative government, of uh, the idea of a proto-political party. He promotes it as a constitutional uh, constraint on the abuse of power through faction, um, as a way of making public uh, political principles um, that can unite people uh, in political parties and which permit the transfer of power without um, uh, the unseemliness of private interest and faction. And above all, he insists on um, parliamentary sovereignty. There's a great misunderstanding in this country. We think we have a country of popular sovereignty and enormous mistakes, um, dare I say, not even a million miles away from um, the coalition government last year in the House of Lords. Um, enormous mistakes are made by people who don't understand that we have parliamentary sovereignty. That is to say, the legitimacy of the elected chamber is offset by the expertise and the long-term focus of the other two branches, the monarchy and the House of Lords. And of course, this imposes responsibilities on them to have that expertise, to have that long-term perspective. But we must never undermine it, and we would do so by electing our second chamber. Uh, and that was one of the reasons, in fact, it was the reason why I was so vociferous against that last year. And finally, and I think this is a, I hope it's an element of this book that I'm able to put in front of you, a book who is not merely, as we would think of him, the architect of political parties and of representative democracy, his great speech to the electors of Bristol, but also someone who thinks about what we now, in a rather rebarbative and financial phrase, would think of as social capital. That is the idea that reason uh, uh, must ultimately be subservient to the emotions, to our uh, social ties, to our feeling for others, to our feeling for institutions, 
to our feeling for practices shared. Uh, and reason, unchained from the emotions, cannot succeed because it does not know what to value. Uh, but when you return to a conception of um, institutions as a locus of our emotions, of, of our identity, of our, uh, uh, of, our, of our affinity to others, of our fellow feeling, on that sense of our compassion, you have a conception of not merely of the institutions that populate the individual, uh, the space between the individual and the state, but actually of society itself. Society is for Burke a foundational uh, category, and I think the idea that um, there is no such thing as society, forget the barbarism of attempting to attribute that to uh, Mrs. Thatcher, um, it is Burke who places the notion of society as a founding category in the idea of conservatism. Um, uh, uh, let me end with one thought and then a very brief reading, if I may, from the book. Burke's is not a philosophy that patronizes uh, its audience. It demands attention, he expected to be listened to, he expected to be understood, and he does not talk down. We have a, a society today in which uh, uh, political debate is at severe risk of becoming truncated and foreshortened, uh, and there is a colossal appetite for a style of political engagement which treats people on their terms uh, and, and treats them with respect. Uh, if I tell you that sound, the idea of a soundbite in, uh, uh, in the modern era, um, the length of a soundbite has actually been measured. Um, in the 1960s, the average length was 49 seconds. Uh, today, it's eight seconds. <laughs> um, and, and it is a wonderful thought that not merely through thought, reflection on work can we re-enchant the world with a sense of renewed possibility and human creativity, but that we could do so in the way in which we communicate with each other and the way in which we publicly deliberate, as Aristotle insists only humans can do, publicly deliberate about our future and about our future governance. Um, if I may, I'm going to end with a very quick reading, which I hope gives you a sense of um, Burke, because I would be wrong, it would be an abomination to discuss Burke without using his own language. Um, and it's a sad moment, but I think it will give you a sense of him. As you may know, he lived the end of his life in some um, um, uh, grief, actually, at the premature death of his son, Richard, at the failure of the impeachment of Hastings, at the way in which Ireland was going up in smoke as he saw it in front of him, despite his great fears and great warnings. And he says, um, uh, in one famous moment, he says, Had it pleased God to continue in me the hopes of succession, I should have been a sort of founder of a family. I should have left a son, this is his son Richard who's died, in all points in which personal merit can be viewed in science, in erudition, in genius, in taste, in honor, in generosity, humanity, in every liberal sentiment, in every liberal accomplishment, would not have shown himself inferior to the Duke of Bedford, with whom he's having a huge fight, or to any of those whom he traces in his line. But I live an in, in, in an inverted order. They who ought to have succeeded me are gone before me. Those, they who should have been to me as posterity are in the place of ancestors. And I say, in the same work, Burke had written, the storm has gone over me and I lie like one of those old oaks which the late hurricane has scattered about me. I am stripped of all my honors. I am torn up by the roots and I lie prostrate on the earth. And I say, lacking in po proper public honors, Burke's life may have been, but his achievement is one of inextinguishable glory. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. CPS doesn't like an intellectual puzzle to go unanswered. And the question of Mrs. Thatcher and Edmund Burke has been raised. And to answer the question, I'm going to introduce you to Lord Thomas. Here he is. Before he speaks, um, I wonder if you would all be kind enough to join me in paying a tribute to a former director of the um, CPS, uh, Professor Ken Minow, who died um, this weekend and who um, lives in our memory very powerfully and with great affection and respect. Um, Lord Thomas was my predecessor as chairman of the Centre for Policy Studies from 1979 to 1991. Therefore, if anyone would be likely to know what Mrs. Thatcher owed or didn't know to um, Edmund Burke, here is Lord Thomas who would like to deliver a postscript. I could just say one thing. Sometime, I think it must have been in 1979, 
Ian Gilmore made a speech saying that um, he wanted to hear something of Burkean conservatism, not Josephian conservatism. And Margaret Thatcher suggested that I should look at Burke and discover something which would support the idea that Burke supported her, not necessarily Ian. And uh, I found a very good speech which Burke had made in 17, I think in 1790, saying that it was fatal when state went to market. Um, that was the beginning of the end for the, the, uh, uh, for the state concerned. And he thought that even then that was the precursor to the revolution which was so destructive in that era. And I think she used this reference uh, in a speech of her own very soon afterwards to her own great satisfaction, indeed to mine. <laughs> 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 Thank you.